together, uh, we have our query. The query goes through a translator, which we're giving you uh, the uh, parser. Uh, and then the uh, parser feeds into a translator that produces a relational algebra script, uh, uh, relational algebra uh, tree, and that relational algebra tree gets evaluated. There's a few steps in the middle there. Don't worry about those for now. Um, we'll get to those in the next couple of lectures. But that's basically the, the outline of how, uh, relational, uh, how SQL gets processed. So, like I said, we talked about, uh, some lectures ago, we talked about set relational algebra with a minor dip into bag relational algebra. And each of these uh, kind of had a couple of very simple operators, a couple of very simple things that uh, you could do with the algebra. And at the end of last lecture, we briefly talked about uh, what might also be needed. So in order to support bag relational algebra, we uh, recognized that we needed uh, some ability to uh, go from bags to sets, namely a distinct operator. Uh, and we also had this, uh, I also mentioned this uh, vague term called outer joins that I didn't really define. I'll get to that this lecture. When working with lists, we talked about a handful of different properties that uh, we want to, or well, what's the one property that a list has? It's ordered. Uh, so we uh, talked about an operator that would go from a bag to a sorted list by ordering the tuples in some specific way. And we talked about a limit operator that allows us to pick out some specific uh, tuples in that list. And finally, we mentioned the need for some ability to do uh, arithmetic over the data in those sets. Uh, so we introduced the extended projection operator, and uh, we recognized the need for some ability to aggregate tuples together. And we'll get into those uh, today as well. So uh, before I get into it, any questions on basically any class stuff up to this point? Great. So we talked about extended projection. And I have a little uh, slight, uh, example that might uh, make this a little more clear. Uh, a uh, extended projection is like a projection in that it has a list of attributes that it produces as an output. But uh, unlike the standard projection, an extended projection uh, defines each of these outputs by an arithmetic or uh, just some sort of function uh, computed over the rows of uh, the row of the inputs. So I might have a, a data set that contains all of the line items uh, for things that I've sold, um, all of the, the order line items for things that I've sold. And I might be interested in a query uh, that computes the price of each item after any kind of discounts have been applied, uh, as well as the amount of profit that I'm making on that particular sale. Uh, so I might compute the price as the price times uh, the discounted price, uh, the discounted uh, proportion. The discount is given as a percentage. Um, the profit would be that value minus, or sorry, the, the cost of the item. I got that backwards, didn't I? Uh, the price minus the cost of the item. So this allows us to do some basic computations on a row by row basis and essentially corresponds to the selection, uh, the select clause in a select statement, the select items of a select statement. All right, so what we, where we stopped last lecture was this idea of uh, aggregation. So we'd already kind of introduced a handful of different aggregate operators, uh, count, count distinct, sum, average, min, max. Uh, so what I want to get into first today is uh, how do we go about implementing these? So if I were trying to sum things up, how would, if I have a, a, a list of records, how would I go about summing up those records? A counter variable. Okay, so I'd create a counter variable, and for every uh, row in my uh, in my data set, I'd add some value to that counter variable. Now, how would I go about computing the count? Uh, sorry, that's the count. How would I go about computing, let's say, the average? Uh, 
OK, counter divided by number of rows. So I'd have two counter variables. I have one that I sum up all of the values that I'm summing up, and one where I count. I just add one for every uh, row that I, that I encounter. And between the, these two counter var variables at the very end, I compute, uh, I divide one by the other. Now, uh, well, let's do one more. How about max? OK, so I have a counter variable, or a, just a variable, that, uh, that always contains the highest value that I've seen so far. And every time I encounter another variable, I add, uh, or I replace the, the uh, sorry, excuse me. Every time I encounter a bigger value, I replace my variable's value with that new bigger value. Now, there's kind of this pattern that seems to be emerging here. I have some kind of variable. I iterate over all of the records of my list. And every, for every record in my list, I do something with that variable. And then at the very end, I perform some kind of computation over that variable. Now there's uh, a functional language uh, construct um, called a fold. You don't have to memorize that term. But the basic pattern of a fold appears quite frequently uh, in aggregate computations. Um, I have some sort of variables that I initialize somehow. And every time I encounter a new tuple, I compute some, I, I make some modifications to these, uh, these variables that I'm keeping track of as I go through the list. And then at the very end, I, I uh, finalize the aggregate by computing some, <coughs> excuse me, by computing uh, some kind of function over those variables. So this, like I said, this basic pattern appears all over the place. And I, I'm going to recommend that you use this kind of structure uh, in when defining aggregates. So that basically uh, going to uh, the, the process for implementing an iterator uh, for an aggregate. Um, ah, yeah. Uh, the process for implementing an aggregate, well, you're going to have to scan through the entire input relation in order to perform the aggregate. So for every tuple that you get as an input, you use this kind of fold structure to add the new records to the aggregate. And then when you get to the very end, well, that's your, your get next tuple. That's the next thing that you're returning. So are there any questions on this idea of building folds? So the, the question is, uh, how do you implement group by? I'll get to that in a few slides. But before, I have a question for you guys. As with all of these, what's the working set size? One tuple. It's whatever those variables are, uh, whatever the, si uh, the state of my fold, um, that's the working set size. All right. So. We actually did that, didn't we? So here's a little bit of a challenge for you guys. Take about uh, two minutes, turn to your neighbor, and try and come up with a fold for this guy, for count distinct. Take about three, let's say three minutes. And just to recap, a fold is an initialize something that gets run for every tuple, and then a finalized step.
Question? All right, does anyone have uh, a solution? OK. We can show each other numbers. And we use a hash we are going to do a hash for that number. And we store it in something like a hash map. And each time we see a new number, we see that something already exists in the hash map. OK, so for every. So here our global variable, or the, the variable for the fold, uh, might be a hash map, and every time, or a hash set, and every time we encounter a new variable, we have to check to see if it's in that hash set, and if not, um, then we can output it. If so, then we don't do anything. Uh, question in the back? Uh, can you, uh, can you sp uh, speak up? Sorry. OK, uh, same, uh, very si similar principle. You, you build a set of records, and then you count how many records are in that set. Now, uh, what's the working set size? It's one, is it one tuple, or how much memory are we using? It's the size of the set. So all of a sudden, so some of, I want you to be aware of this distinction. Some aggregates you can compute quite efficiently uh, with a very small amount of memory. But there are some aggregates, uh, distinct, median um, are the two common ones, that require an amount of memory that is proportional to the size of the input. Um, so be aware of that. OK. so. We've talked about aggregation. Aggregation computes some basic um, aggregate properties of the, the data. Now, there's a variant of aggregation, or a variant operator, that uh, called the grouping operator. Now, the grouping operator takes uh, both a set of uh, key parameters and a set of aggregate parameters. So for every unique value of the key parameters, we're going to build an aggregate value for every tuple that, has, that shares those key parameters. So for every a, b, let's say, um, for every uh, distinct value of a, b, we're going to compute a count, and we're going to compute a sum. So in this setting, what would our output schema be for this grouping operator? OK, so it's going to be all of the keys plus uh, one uh, attribute for every aggregate value as well. So in this case, a, b, c, c, d, s, and all of the missing values. Um, what do you mean by it can be a subset? That's, that's an interesting point. So the, uh, you might want, while the group, uh, there are some situations where you might actually want a subset of the grouping columns. That's a, that's a great observation. Um, and a good chance to talk about uh, the design of these, uh, these operators. So, Above all else, when picking, uh, 
when pick, uh, designing a intermediate representation for a compiler, for a query processor, for anything, um, what, what should be your main goal? Or the main goals? What are the purpose? Uh, what are the design considerations when building something like relational algebra? Hmm? Parsing. What do you mean by parsing? Okay, so it needs to be. Uh, it needs to be able to rep. Uh, let me rephrase that slightly. It needs to be able to represent all of the queries that you'd like to. Uh, encode. So it needs to be expressive. Okay, so it needs to be expressive on the one hand. Hmm? Unambiguous. Unambiguous, uh, or more generally, it needs to be simple. Uh, so you, you want it as expressive as necessary, but then again, as simple as possible. So in the interest of simplicity, if we wanted to restrict ourselves to a subset of the attributes in the group by column, what should we, uh, can we express that using this simple group by operator and something else that we already have? Yeah? A, a group by or a Let me flip the order there. So you can, uh, if you're interested in only the column A, then uh, even though you're st you still want to group by A, B, then you can put a projection on top of this and reduce your schema, but now you have a much simpler group by operator that doesn't have this corner case of having to have some uh, group by elements in its output, some group by elements not in its output. Now when you're implementing this, all of the, that simplicity might go away uh, for the sake of efficiency, but starting from a simple baseline uh, makes it much easier to get things right and makes it much easier to implement things uh, quickly. So, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so group by aggregates, same basic deal as aggregation, except now you have this uh, extra step of having to find uh, a gr find um, to store multiple aggregate values or multiple folds. So you can build up a data structure like a hash map or a uh, or something like that that stores every single record uh, that stores every single group that you've encountered, uh, one for every single set of keys, and have one of these kind of intermediate folds stored for each uh, group. Other than that, it's the same basic deal. Oh, and of course I just answered that. Um, so what's the working set size here? Uh, max of n, what do you mean by n? The map size. So this is going to be the size, uh, the number of groups that you encounter is going to be your working set size here. Is that necessarily going to work? I see some heads shaking no. Why? Yeah? For example, there are, like, all the tuples are unique on primary key. Okay, so if all of the tuples are unique, or more generally, uh, what, what would happen then? Yeah, so it will go out of primary key. Right, so there's, at any time that your working set size uh, gets tied to the amount of memory, uh, sorry, the amount of uh, data you have, there's always the chance that you'll run out of memory. Now for project one, uh, keeping everything in memory is fine. Uh, in project two, we'll and actually the next couple lectures, we'll start talking about ways of dealing with the fact that you might not have enough memory to deal with, uh, to have everything in memory at once. Okay. Now, why don't you guys, uh, so we've, we've talked about this grouping operator. Just to make sure that you guys uh, have a sense of how it works. 
why don't you guys take maybe five minutes or so, turn to your, uh, turn to your neighbor, and ask yourselves, can I implement distinct using the grouping operator? Uh, so select distinct, sorry, the, the distinct operator, not count distinct. Uh, a fold. Uh, you don't necessarily need to make a fold, but well, use whatever you need. If you need to create a new aggregate, uh, do that. Uh, basically, how would you express if I wanted to do uh, to compute a distinct? So d distinct is find me all of the unique. Uh, transform a bag into a set. Find me every unique tuple in that bag. I am uh, implying to you that it is possible to express that using the group, the grouping operator, uh, using uh, by implementing a a, sp uh, a specific, excuse me, implementing a specific group by query. If you want to use select, go for uh, a select query. Uh, that's another way of expressing it. However you want, use a group by query to express the distinct operator. All right, any ideas? Yeah. I think I think uh, I'm hearing the right thing. But just to make sure, so using a group by query, I would uh, let's say I want to uh, do a select distinct. Uh, what is the select distinct? Um, uh, right, distinct. I want to do a distinct of R. So how would I? Uh, I would express that. You said select 
our store. Are any aggregates in here? Group by R. Does everyone see what this query is doing? So someone else, what is this query doing? To create a group of all of the uh, a group for all of the unique uh, values. Now, normally you compute one or more aggregates here, but in this case, you don't care about aggregates. All you care about is those unique groups. There you have it. Uh, select using group by to implement distinct. Great. Okay. Um, right. Yes. Okay, let's uh, go through an example. Uh, let's say I have two attributes in here, A and B, and where did I put that chalk? So I've got uh, A and B, and here I have A and B. So let me come up with a really simple table here. Can everyone see this? Okay. So I've got A and B. And let's say I have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1. That's good. So what should the output of uh, distinct be here? 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1. Okay, now how is this data set going to interact with that query? Or how, how would you evaluate this query over that? Or let me make this. Let me change that so it's actually an aggregate. Uh, there's actually an aggregate there. How would I? Evaluate this. So I go through my data. I have two copies of one one. They'd go into my aggregate, right? So A B count. So for the group one one, I'd compute a count of two. For the group one two, oh, come on, you guys are speak up. One. Thank you. Uh, and 2, 1? All right. Um, OK. So I have A, B, that's a group, and I have the aggregate value. Now, if I'm computing distinct, do I? I don't care about this. In fact, I want all of these to be 1. I just project it away. I'm projecting it away, the same as rewriting this query to just that. So you get group by. Oh, sorry, you get distinct. Does that address your, your question? Anything else? All right. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit because there's one, <coughs> there's one aspect of uh, data management that I haven't covered uh, just yet. It's the idea that there's some cases where there might be data values that you're working with that you don't know. You don't know what they are, or they're simply not appropriate in the given setting. So Spock, for example, is an alien. He doesn't have a last name. So uh, show of hands, who here has a dot in their name? No? Uh, sorry, not uh, well. I shouldn't be raising my hand, but uh, okay. So there's a few people who here who know know what I'm talking about. There's uh, some cases where there are data values that uh, just, for whatever reasons, cultural or uh, anything, uh, don't quite mesh with the schema that you're working with. 
So for example, I might have an officer that isn't assigned to a ship. Um, SQL uh, has this mechanism for dealing with this called a null value. N a null value makes things uh, quite a bit more complicated. In the interest of simplicity, I haven't gone into this, but well, it's something you should be aware of. So let's say you have an officer who doesn't have a rank. And I ask the question, give me all officers whose rank is at least three. How does that interact with an officer who doesn't have a rank, or an officer who has a rank of null? Hmm? It fails. Um, why do you say it fails? So what kind of, uh, null is not a valid number, so what kind of failure would you expect? A mathematical error, or uh, an exception of some sort. You'd think that. Of course, that makes things way too simple. So the way that SQL handles this is to introduce uh, what it calls a three-valued Boolean algebra or three-valued logic. In other words, a Boolean expression can either be true, it can be false, or it can be unknown. You can think of this a little bit as uh, in floating point numbers, you have infinity or you have um, divide by zero. You have these special values that correspond to kind of weird corner cases. And just like in that case, uh, null and unknown kind of pollute everything that they touch in a very specific way. Now, this predicate would fail on uh, an officer who had a rank of null, but it would fail because the WHERE clause uh, would see an unknown value, and the WHERE clause keeps only values that are true. So a value that is false gets thrown away, that's obvious, but a value that's unknown also gets thrown away. Now how would you expect this to interact with Boolean predicates like AND, OR, or NOT? Hmm? Okay, so AND of unknown and true would be unknown itself. What about and of unknown and false? false? False. Good. So if I can deterministically assign a truth value based on the unknown, then I get a deterministic truth value. So and of unknown and false is false. And similarly, and of unknown and true is true, because whatever that unknown value is, is going to be, uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, now why am I throwing all of this at you? Throwing all of this at you because the last part of uh, relational algebra, uh, extended relational algebra, that uh, I'm going to talk about relies on null values. Now why is that? Okay, so let's say you have a bunch of data. And that data might describe a bunch of ships, and it might describe a bunch of locations that those ships are at. Now the observant among you might notice that uh, the ship labeled 1701 is currently located at a subspace anomaly. Now what happens to ships that are located near subspace anomalies? Anyone? Hmm? They destroyed, or they vanish, or somehow vanish off the face of the Earth. Poof. Yay animations. Um, so let's say I wanted to know where the Enterprise was located after it vanished in, mysteriously in this subspace anomaly. I might ask a question. I might ask a query, a very straightforward uh, query like this. Uh, give me the location of the ship named Enterprise over the join of ships and locations. 
Now, what would the query result for this be? Hmm? Empty. I wouldn't get anything. I wouldn't even get anything saying that there was a ship named Enterprise. And for all I know, this query uh, might, be, might have a typo in it. I might have a misspelled Enterprise, for example. Is that what we're looking for? No, we want to know that there is a ship called Enterprise, but that we don't necessarily know its location. So we'd like the response not to be an empty set, but to be a set containing a null value. And that's where outer joins come in. So there's this, uh, so what we'd like to see is an output uh, for every, if I got rid of that selection predicate, what we'd like to see is an output where each of the tuples that didn't get matched had a corresponding uh, null value in all of the attributes that were missing. Now in this case, the missing attributes are coming from the location table. So, well, let me back up. Uh, so this, uh, the, the term for this kind of uh, a join, a special join, where all of the uh, missing attributes from one relation get paired up with null values from the other is called an outer join. And the symbol for this, uh, well, there's a handful of symbols because there are three different versions of an outer join. Um, one uh, where you keep all of, the t uh, all of the tuples that have no match um, all of the tuples on the left-hand side that aren't matched by tuples on the right side this is called a left outer join. One where you ha uh, keep all of the tuples on the right side that aren't matched by something on the left, and this is called a right outer join. And one where you keep uh, tuples that aren't matched on either side. And this is uh, sometimes referred to as a full outer join or just an outer join. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, that, is the, uh, that is the test to see that everyone is awake. You pass. Any, uh, any questions on outer joints? Or anything we've covered so far? Uh, can you speak up? So the question is, when, uh, when would we use an outer join as opposed to a normal join? Is that correct? Uh, so typically, you would use an inner join in just about every single circumstance that you'd care to, because outer joins tend to be more expensive. Outer joins are used when you know that one set of attributes is going to potentially be missing or sorry, one, one side of the join is going to be missing tuples, but you'd still like some sort of result. Uh, let me give you a simple example. Let's say that you have a... list of officers per ship and a list of ships. There might be some ships that have no officers. And in that case, let's say I wanted to count the number of officers on each ship. I'd need to use an outer join on that because, like I said, there are some ships with no officers. So what would happen if I just did an aggregate, uh, aggregate group by ship, uh, aggregate count group by ship over the officers table? Hmm? Right, so there would be some ships that are missing. But if I join that back, if I do an outer join back with the ship's relation, I'd get a null value in each of those fields where there weren't any officers on the ship. And then I could do a simple scan through that, replacing all the null values with zeros, because that's what I'm looking for. Yes, yeah, so you need to know something about the data beforehand. Um, like I said, this is a very, this is probably more situational 
uh, than you'd encounter in a general basis. Actually, the grading system uses this. The, the project submission system uses a couple of outer joins uh, to compute so that each group shows up even if they haven't, each group sh shows up for a given project even if they haven't submitted uh, a project yet. There's an example. Uh, but because it's more expensive, you generally want to avoid this if possible. Does that address your question? Any others? All right. Well, um, all of this is basically covered in very nice detail in, um, in the textbook in uh, section five. I encourage you to, to review that. Um, the project submission system uh, should be, uh, as of tonight, it will uh, most likely, hopefully it will be accepting uh, submissions for project one. Uh, and on Wednesday, we'll go over uh, the details. I'll basically tie everything that we've, uh, we've covered or summarize everything that we've covered so far um, with kind of pointers to, uh, to what needs to get uh, done, at least to duplicate the reference implementation. Any, que any other questions? All right, well, I will see everyone on Wednesday. Like I said, project submissions uh, should hopefully be running later tonight, and I'll start posting videos hopefully tomorrow.